great anti-hero because, and this is going to sound crazy, because she was a bona fide sociopath. (laughs) (laughs) And so she could take on different roles to suit herself sort of socially and politically and romantically. Um, But, you know, essentially an anti-hero is a character who really looks more like a villain than your standard hero. And when you think about modern culture, the easiest ones to look at are the ones that we all have been watching on TV for the last 25 years. You know, uh, Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, uh, Dexter, of course, is a great anti-hero, though not a great television show. Um, you know, these, these characters that um, have their own moral code where they go out and they exert themselves to have the life that they want to live or to bring chaos to its heel. Now, chaos can be a number of things, right? So chaos, if you're a mobster, is the FBI coming after you. Like, oh my God, the FBI is coming after me. Chaos, if you are, um, you know, just an average person living in the world, might be that you're living under a fascist proto-dictator during a worldwide pandemic when no one believes anything anymore. And someone comes to write that. So in this case, maybe maybe Tony Fauci was our anti-hero <laughs> during, <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> By the way, can I just say the villainization of, of Anthony Fauci is one of the most oh absurd God. things. Oh, my God. I mean, this guy is just a sweet nerd. Can we yes. just, I mean, please. Well, you know, and, you know, I think about this as, I mean, this is totally related to what we're talking about. This, I think about this as it relates to Guy Fieri. <laughs> That is, this seems like a leap, I understand, listeners. But I, and and maybe not so much now, because I just saw a picture of him at like a boxing match with, with Trump and they seem chummy. But I saw this comic get up and say, um, you know, people give Guy Fieri a lot of shit because he looks weird and he's sort of a douchebag. But all this guy does is drive around the country, go to mom and pop restaurants and tell you to eat there. <laughs> He's the chef. I don't even know who these guy, this guy is. The Guy Fieri, like the, the chef he, dude. Yeah, he does diners, drive-ins, and dives. Oh. So all he does is drive around to different places and tell you to eat locally for mom-and-pop places that need the money. <laughs> and then those places become madly successful. And, and you're like, we hate him. He's a monster. How dare he? I'm going to Chili's. Yeah, you know, I did uh, years ago. Anthony uh, Bourdain used to do this, right? He would make right. a, a restaurant famous. And there's a restaurant in L.A., like this Thai restaurant that he was like, it's just down home. You know, it was always that kind of thing. It's authentic. And so one day I was at work and one of my coworkers and I, I was like, come with me. I'm going to take you to like this place. It was so disgusting. <laughs> I was like, it's sort of like that whole thing, how like the fetishization of dive bars. Yes. You're like, you know what? I don't want to go to a bar where there's like feces no. like smeared no. on the bathroom wall. Like that doesn't no. charm me. You know? No, I re- that whole era, like when we were in our 20s in L.A. where it was like we because I, I blame swingers where we all had to go to coach and horses. Hey, I got news for you. I don't want to go to coach and horses. <laughs> I want to go somewhere where people pee in the toilet. I'm yeah, just, right. I'm just saying. Or what was that place? God, what was that place in Hollywood? It, like the most filthy fucking place. I'm oh, forgetting. There was a lot of them. And, and then there was like um, Cat and Fiddle, which was like a higher class dive bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no, they, had, but... they had seating outside. <laughs> what was it called? It's called like the Rocket or the... I forget. But anyway, yeah. So but these are the kinds of places anti-heroes hang out. Like, <laughs> so it's a perfect segue. Um, so I'll, I'll give you sort of a more technical notion of the anti-hero. Um, so I said it before, like if these characters, if the anti-heroes seem more close to villains, think about this, that the villains are the people that often usher in history. We know about things because bad people do things. <laughs> um, the anti-hero is the person though, that, that corrects the worst of them. And we really start to see the rise of the anti-hero beginning in the 1920s. So post-World War I, um, post, um, post the sort of Wild West era, where the, the lone stranger, the Shane, right? The Shane who comes to town, the stranger comes to town, the lone gunslinger. The lone gunslinger is replaced by the private detective assassin anti-hero. 
So it's also this notion of Western expansion and who comes in to correct the bad things. So several of the sort of most iconic novels of the 1920s, 1930s, invariably have at their core a crime that reflects sort of a larger social issue and then some badass who comes in to crack heads and take things. <laughs> but the, the anti-hero is, like you say, it's a villain who is sort of correcting the worst of the excesses. If we're using like Walter White as a popular example, he's obviously a, what, a middle school teacher who becomes a meth dealer. Right. But how does he correct the worst of the excesses? Well, he recognizes that as a middle school um, math teacher, that the American edu education system is a Ponzi scheme, a Ponzi scheme that he's been a part of for his entire career, and that he's dying of cancer and has absolutely no money, even though he's devoted his entire life to educating the youth of America. He's facing the dead end of life with nothing. Oh, oh, wait, so he's correcting the excesses of the system, like the teaching system, not the excesses necessarily of like the meth dealing system. Correct. Correct. Like he is a response to, I can't have a good life as a teacher. Right. Which is crazy, but also true. <laughs> as, yeah. a, as a professor, I can tell you that, in fact, most of us do a little bit of meth on the side. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, we got some kind of side hustle. I just write, I write crime novels. Um, but think about Dexter, okay? Dexter is working as a crime scene analyst at the Miami Police Department. And the Dexter show comes from a series of novels by um, Pete Lindsay, I think his name was. Um, and Dexter has a code. He is going to kill the people who are the worst possible villains that are out there because the Miami police are so feckless they can't catch them themselves. So he's going to correct that problem. Tony Soprano, as the anti-hero leader of the Sopranos, um, he recognizes that the mafia needs to be modernized in order to be successful. He recognizes that his own lack of empathy is causing him to have panic attacks. And so he's now at this place where he's having this, uh, when the show starts, this crisis of confidence because he's feeling anxiety about his family, anxiety about his business, anxiety about himself, and anxiety about those ducks. You know, and so all of these things play a role into how he is now also going to right-size his business. Um, what about so, what about Sal Cooperteen? I mean, you're, <laughs> I mean, right? Because he he's, right. he he qualifies. Yeah. So Sal and, and Sal Sal Cooperteen for people listening is the protagonist of Todd's outstanding series of gangster novels. The most recent of which is Gangsters Never Die. Right. Don't die. Don't die. I knew. Yep, I knew it. Gangsters I think, die. I think they eventually die. So never probably. <laughs> Gangsters don't die. D Gangsters don't die. So Sal Cupertine really is. Um, so he pretends to be a rabbi, but he's really a hitman. And what he finds as he works as a rabbi, as he pretends to be a rabbi for many years, is that the skills that he had as a hitman translate well into being a rabbi, because all people want is someone who has confidence in their job. Someone who can tell them what the end is going to be like and what's going to happen next. And the hitman, he he has some simple answers to this. You're going to die. It will then be blackness. <laughs> um, the rabbi is supposed to give you some sense of hope, right? But the other thing that, that Sal Cupertine does in these, in these novels in a, in a larger way is ask questions about how organized crime has infiltrated every aspect of our society, from our church um, to our education system um, to the mortgage system um, to our entertainment. Um, he serves as sort of a, a Greek chorus that is indicting America for losing the, the notion of what the American dream was. The, the American dream used to be um, about possibility, about you could do anything. The American dream now is, what can you get away with? And it's a slight difference, but it's that difference that the history of criminality has brought into us. 
It's not about possibility. It's about getting away with it. And organized crime has always been about getting away with it. The anti-hero, in some ways, corrects that or gets away with it and then in some form tries to figure out a way to help society get some small aspect of it back. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in the anti-hero that I, as a writer, I've always found appealing um, for several reasons. The first being that I, th I think I'm a nice person, but if I were violent or I could fight, I don't think I'd be a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but the, I should say, too, you know, I think for the, the average person out there who hears the term anti-hero, it's kind of like the villain you cheer for. Right, exactly. I mean, that's it. It's like, it's like the hero, but they're villainous, but we kind of like them anyway, and somehow we find ourselves rooting for them, even though along the way they do some pretty heinous things. Yeah, because they, they are less awful than the, than the awfulness that they're fighting. Um, and, you know, when you think about sort of why we need anti-heroes versus Superman. So, you know, Superman and all those those superheroes, they come up in response to, you know, World War II, right? Like Hitler's going to go, or uh, Superman's going to go kill Hitler. There's that actual comic, you know? Well, I got news for you. It didn't work. Superman <laughs> didn't kill Hitler. Uh, uh, Superman didn't land in Auschwitz and save the Jews. Um, so it's nice to have these sort of fantasies of someone coming to save us but the reality is, is that bad things happen and no one's coming to save you, that you have to try to save yourself. And the role of the anti-hero often in literature and, and in film is that person who's willing to do whatever it takes to, to right a wrong. Um, but, you know, so there's this sort of like the Dirty Harry kind, right, where he's just going to kill everybody, he doesn't care. And, of course, Dirty Harry is also just a cop who's really bad at his job. Like, yeah, I'm not going to follow the rules. I'm just going to plug a couple guys. Um, and it's like, oh, surprise, Clint Eastwood, not a great person. Oh, I'm stunned to learn this. You know what people forget about, Brad? Speaking of, of Clint Eastwood, and listeners, uh, if you never knew about this, say you're like 10 years older and you're just listening for the first time. Do you remember when Clint Eastwood argued with a chair at the Republican <laughs> National Convention? I, I am old enough to remember that, yeah. I don't think we talk about that enough, and I'd like to talk about that solely in this <laughs> podcast. Oh, my God. So, at any rate, um, so I've always been fascinated with this notion of um, sort of a likable villain, uh, an anti-hero that um, you want to spend time with. Because if there's one thing that I've tried to do with my own characters, with Sal Cooper team, by imbuing him with the sense of faith that he essentially has to have to become a rabbi is that you begin to understand the way that he is starting to see the world, that his understanding that there might be something larger than himself, larger than his job builds bridges toward empathy and an anti-hero with empathy um, often is sort of what we think of as, um, you know, a, a charming scalawag, you know, the, like Maverick or something. Um, someone that we really find ourselves wanting to have a beer with, but we probably wouldn't want to be married to them. You know what I mean? Um, and I think the person that really created this in American literature essentially is Elmore Leonard. You know, he, he was the guy that gave George Clooney a reason to wear a suit in movies and look, you know, really sexy. Roguish and charming. Roguish and charming. And, you know, there's an old saying about charm. And uh, I admit to recognizing that I, that I do this myself sometimes. But the old saying is, um, the thing about charm is it makes both you and the person you're charming feel pretty great about you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's not the best of me, but I use it sometimes. And Brad, I hate to inform you of this. I've heard this show. <laughs> you do. <it. laughs> Every once in a while. Every once in a while. You, you have that little glimmer of a, of a nice vampire. Um, but Elmore Leonard, when he sort of shifted from writing westerns to writing crime novels, um, he, he sort of created the archetype of the lovable antihero, the, the, the crook 
with not a heart of gold because the crook really does shitty stuff, but the crook who has a code and lives by it. Um, so, and, and can I interrupt? Cause like sure. for, for people who are like listening, it seems like, like you just said that the, the crook who has a code, it seems like there have to be rules Yes. yes. in terms of how we build an anti-hero. Like certain things have to happen on the page in order for the anti-hero to come off and to qualify. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think the, the, the biggest unwritten rule is the anti-hero has to love someone and be loved by someone. Otherwise, they're just a sociopath, you know? Um, lately, I don't know what it's on, Hulu or something. At night, my wife has been watching like a 45-minute show where it's just psychopaths being interviewed after they've murdered everyone. And they keep talking about like, oh, this guy's charming, that guy's charming. But really what they're able to do is play act. They're able to mirror. That's not what an antihero does. An antihero actually has feelings for something and is and is loved by someone else. And therefore you can understand that person. It's hard for us to understand Jeffrey Dahmer because he's not he he doesn't possess the same ability to think and feel that we do. And so therefore he's unknowable. He's a monster, right? But we understand um, we understand the guy who goes to court after someone has raped their child or something, takes a gun and shoots the guy, right? Like, we understand that guy. We understand that person's point of view because the world has gone so sour that they cannot imagine any way that justice will be enough, that they have to take justice into their own hands. That, that's not an anti-hero. I mean, that's a vigilante, but we understand it. We get that. The anti-hero is a little different. And, and the way I like to think about it is actually something that Elmore Leonard wrote. Um, so everyone knows Elmore Leonard's 10 rules for writing, um, which are, are really tongue-in-cheek. People take them as being like actual rules from God. But it's just Elmore Leonard essentially saying, like, don't suck. Like, do, we, do we know what they are? Or like, are people can just find those online. Well, the, the big ones are, you know, never start a book with weather, no adverbs, you know, you never need anything other than sad, uh, easy on the exclamation points, things right. like that. Right, right, right. Which, which is just sort of good writing. But what he also says is that he he lists each of these 10 things. And then he says, unless you're dot, dot, dot. So like never start with weather unless you're Rick Bass. You know, never write with tons of exclamation points unless you're James Elroy. Um, not that I'm a big Elroy fan. Um, and I think you should go easy on the exclamation points. <laughs> uh, um, I've always anyway. like I've always liked the uh the definite like people who use exclamation points, it's like laughing at your own joke. You gotta like take it easy. <clears throat> right. It's like being carrot top. It's right. like being it's like being carrot top on the dating game. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Enough said. Um oh god, that reminds me. Have you seen, incidentally, that great clip of Norm MacDonald, who's one of my favorite comics? on Conan O'Brien, and he's talking to a woman who had been on um, uh, Melrose Place, and she's about to start in a movie with Carrot Top. Is any of this making any sense to you? No. I, I don't. Oh, Brad, don't cut this, because everyone, stop listening. <laughs> Go find the clip of Norm MacDonald talking about Carrot Top on Conan O'Brien. Right. Anyway, so <laughs> everyone knows, and if you don't know, you can go look him up, the, the sort of famous Elmore Leonard 10 Rules for Writing. But before he did that, and he wrote this for the New York Times, in one of his very old novels, a novel called Swag, which is great, um, but it's also sort of a strange thing because it used to be called Ryan's Rules, and then he re-released it with a different title, which is not any better, which is Swag. <laughs> um, but in, in Swag, the, the main character has um, 10 rules for being an effective criminal, essentially. When you read it, though, you recognize that it's actually Elmore Leonard laying out his thesis for every single character he would write for the next 35 years. Um, so I'm just going to read them off, and we can talk about them if you like. It's your show. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, so number one, always be polite on the job and say please and thank you. All right. How many times have you guys seen a movie or read a book where it's the it's the charming bank robber, the most charming bank robber ever being um, 
uh, a creation of Elmore Leonard's, the main character Jack Foley from the book Out of Sight, portrayed uh, by George Clooney in the film version. It's a great film. One of the best films ever. Steven, uh, Steven Soder- Soderbergh's best, in my opinion. And I, can I also say, I think I've said this before on this show, this is how much it incenses me, but like Jennifer Lopez in that movie. Brilliant. I'm like, why did that? I, I feel like Hollywood has failed her. Like she was wonderful in that film. And I don't feel like she's ever gotten a role that's no anywhere near that. I could feel, I mean, maybe I haven't seen her full oeuvre, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen a lot of movies that she's in. The, the closest that she's ever come in my view to that. I mean, she was great in Selena and she was a remarkable and out of sight. And then she was pretty good in this movie Hustle, I think it was called, something like that where she's a female, uh, she's a stripper, and she's running a criminal organization. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was pretty good. came out a couple years ago. Um, number two, never say more than necessary. Less is more. Well, the iconic notion of the lone gunman is sort of the silent guy who walks into the room and just says one quip and then shoots you in the back of the head or whatever. Um, or the one thing that that person says is really funny or really insightful. Um and that's the history of noir fiction, is the laconic main character. Uh, number three, never call your partner by name unless you use a made-up name. Again, this shows up in Out of Sight, um, which is, I think, Leonard's best um, book, but also the best adaptation of, um, of his work, where uh, in the great scene in the, in the movie where Jack Foley and... Um, and Karen Sisko are sitting in a bar and they're pretending to be other people. They're trying to take a break from reality. And in order to be an anti-hero and to live your own life, you have to constantly take breaks from reality. Because even when you're an anti-hero, like you gotta go to Target, you know what I mean? Like even when you're an anti-hero, you're like, you know what? I would like to try that nacho Dorito at Taco Bell thing. Like, that sounds delicious. But these, but these are the kinds of things that I think endear anti-heroes to readers and viewers or whatever, is that they have these relatable human moments that are just exactly. every day. Exactly. Which brings us to number four. Never look suspicious or like a bum. Dress well. So think about every um, iconic badass crook they always got some personal style to them you know the think about the godfather in the godfather michael corleone is always dressed to the nines you know or when you think about even um a television show like burn notice for instance where which i wrote the books for um michael weston is always in a beautiful linen suit with an open collared blue shirt uh but if he's at home he's wearing a tight just like you and me right now a tight black shirt where his you know just sort of enhances his like you and me our muscles and our <laughs> our biceps like he always looks good or even back in the day jim rockford always wore a sport coat and a nice shirt and drove a nice car um these are all anti-heroes but they all make sure that they don't look like a criminal they look like a bank manager or a model or okay something. so a couple things I, I think like what you're saying is that when you dress up your anti-hero and when you have them do ordinary things like go to Target, these are skillful ways to give the reader the fewest possible opportunities to outright hate your character. Absolutely. It's harder to hate somebody who looks good in a $3,000 suit right? and who like is charming and shops at Target and you know buys the Doritos or whatever. Right. Uh, on the page, as you are writing your uh, gangster fiction, do, do you have to do like like research into fashion like you don't know what I'm saying? like how much how much detail are you going into when you're dressing <laughs> sal cupertine well sal cupertine wears a suit every single day because he's a rabbi and he's not an orthodox rabbi and so when you're not an orthodox rabbi you just wear really nice suits every day and so when in the first book that i wrote gangsterland he gets to this house where he's gonna be living and he opens up his closet and it's filled with stolen three thousand dollar suits for him to wear and this is a key part about being a religious leader which is also about being an anti-hero the best religious leaders don't dress like don't aren't flashy they're they are um bespoke 
You know, the, the reason we don't believe in Tammy Faye and Jim Baker anymore um, is that they started to look like cartoon characters. You want your religious leaders to, if you really are going to follow them, you want them to look like CEOs. And, and this is the interesting thing about, um, for instance, the, the premier of China. The premier of China wears the most beautiful suits you've ever seen in your life. I love his ties. Now, I'm not saying I'm a commie. <laughs> You're talking about Xi. Xi, yeah. Beautiful suits. Beautiful suits. Whereas our last president before Biden dressed out of men's warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's up with the long tie? I don't, I'll yeah, never yeah. understand. It, it, he's trying to hide his belly, and he's doing a really shitty job. <laughs> um, but th this notion of dress for the job that you want, you know, which is sort of ingrained inside of us, I think actually does change your perception because it, it's a uniform. And when you put on that uniform, you are that person. So for instance, um, <laughs> I, uh, I went on a book tour with my dear friend, Rob Roberge, who I think has been on the show before. Yeah. And um, Rob, uh, his, in addition to being a, a writer and a professor is also for many, many years, a punk rock musician. And so we toured together and every morning I would wake up and I would iron the shirt that I'm going to wear to the event. I'd shower, I'd get dressed and Rob would wake up and wear what he was wearing to bed to the <laughs> event. And Rob said to me, are, are you going to shower and change every day? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to shower and change every day. And he said, why? And I was like, well, number one, Fans are coming out to meet me. I want to look nice for them. And number two, um, when I put on like a nice outfit, I remind myself that I'm doing business. And he's like, oh, yeah. That's, uh, like, people buy your books. And I was like, right. <laughs> right. People buy my books. Uh, the, when he said to me, are you going to shower every day? That's when I knew that Rob and I were going to be friends for life. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I want to say too, you know, like this is another interesting twist to the whole anti-hero thing is that, you know, we have them doing ordinary things. We have them doing things that make it harder to hate them. And yet there's also something kind of aspirational in them. Yes, absolutely. Because they're usually absolutely. attractive or they're often attractive. They're dressing maybe better than we do in our normal, right. you know, not many of us are walking around in $3,000 suits on a daily basis. So there's something about that that is attractive, right? That yes. draws us in. Right. And that, that actually goes to number five on this list, which is never use your own car. Now, here's the reason for this. Most people that are anti-heroes and con men, they don't actually have very good cars because they aren't great at making payments. <laughs> you know, they, they're doing this stuff because they don't have a regular job. And so they're often, you know, driving not great automobiles. So you want to have a car that is dependable. You go out and you steal yourself a Cadillac. <laughs> you know, the Cadillac is not going to break down on you. It's solid. It's big. If need be, you pop the trunk. You could lay six bodies in an old caddy's trunk. That's nice. <laughs> you want that. You get yourself a Fleetwood. Um, all right, number six. Oh, this is important. This is so important, Brad. And this is also applicable to your own life. <laughs> Never count the take in the car. So that means never stop and count your money. But it's also a philosophy, right? I mean, it it, it, it ends up sliding into the Kenny Rogers ethos of uh, don't look at your money when you're sitting at the table. Um, but it's also about like, hey, you know what? Don't stop to glorify yourself. Don't look around and be like, did anyone notice me? Look at me. I got money. I'm this. I'm that. It's just like, take your shit. Go on to the next count. Don't stop and count the money in the car. You're always going to get caught. And so this is something, this is a rule that's like, it is what it says it is, but it's also about attitude. Yes, absolutely. Counting your money in the car is kind of nervous behavior. It's not it, confident. It means you haven't been there before. Right. You haven't done it before. Right. It's like, the, it's like those, um, those NFL players who, when they get to the end zone, uh, they just drop the ball and they walk off. That's a guy like he's been in the end zone before. Or he just hands the ball to the ref. 
Right. Like LaDainian Tomlinson used to just hand the ball, shake his hand, ask him about his 401k. <laughs> I don't I don't need a guy that's got a whole dance routine. I mean, it's it's entertaining. And as a Raiders fan, I don't see a lot of people in the end zone anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's like, I, I like the dude who just walks in and he's like, I just took care of business. You want this ball? Here you go, sir. Um, so it, it is absolutely about confidence. Um, number seven. Now, I, it's important to... <laughs> to give a proviso here that Elmore Leonard wrote this in the 1970s. So I want you all to understand that Elmore Leonard and I do not share the same opinions about women and about their validity um, and about the equal rights uh, era. Okay, number seven. <laughs> Never flash money in a bar or with women. <laughs> so... You know, Elmore Leonard came from the femme fatale sort of era of noir fiction. He grew as an adult and, and started writing uh, women heroes like Karen Sisko from Out of Sight, for instance. Um, but in the 1970s, he, he was a big sort of femme fatale writer. And so you never flash your money in a bar or with women. What he's essentially saying is don't don't be a big shot. You're going to get rolled or you're going to be pointed out as a mark. Yeah. I mean, but I think that's, I mean, I get it. I don't think it's too terrible. I think what he's just, again, it's a, it's about confidence. Yeah. If you've got money and you're used to having money, there's probably less of a desire to like, let people know about it. It's something, yeah. it's something you handle quietly. Yeah, exactly. Well, hold on a sec. Charles, bring me my gold. Yeah. <laughs> my bag of gold. Thank you. You just, you know, you get the table at the restaurant, you pay the, you pay the bill. It's no big deal. I will say though, this is the important thing. The only time I ever talk about money is as it relates to the most important purchase I've ever made in my entire life. Can I tell you about this, Brad? Yeah, please. My wife actually bought it for me. She bought me an espresso machine that cost like $1,000 on my 50th birthday. Greatest purchase of our entire lives. Wow. I don't ever go to Starbucks anymore. It's a money-saving experience. Yeah. And it gets me this hyped up every single day. <laughs> immediately <laughs> it's both therapeutic medicinal makes me happy money well spent and i never have to go to starbucks anymore and it saves you money starbucks is, I mean, saves if, me money. if you go to starbucks every day you're spending what it's like seven dollars oh, for a latte now so that's you, the thing yeah. yeah i'm actually helping america there you are look at you i am <laughs> i am i don't know how but i feel like i am <laughs> all right which brings us to in fact, this, this does bring us to this. I didn't even realize it. Number eight, never go back to an old bar or hangout once you have moved up. Once you get your own espresso machine, you don't go to Coffee Bean. <laughs> it's you over. Don't go there. Those days it's are over. done. Yeah, I don't need some 19-year-old named Cam to misspell my name. <laughs> I, I can make my own goddamn coffee at home. It's 1D, Cam. It's 1D. 1D. <laughs> I left the other D in your mom. Oh, sorry. But this is like, that's, I think I, I'm, I am an antihero. So again, once what, what they're saying is like, you gotta, you gotta leave, you gotta leave those old friends behind. So this is, this is a, a, a great thing that I saw recently. And it's about the ultimate gangster. Um, my favorite recent president. We've I've talked a lot about presidents lately. I don't know why. Um, but President Obama. Um, I saw Michelle Obama being interviewed by Oprah on some special on Netflix or something. It was, there was no sports on. Um, and Oprah said to Michelle, who's awesome, by the way, and whose book I loved, um, you know, do you have a tight circle of friends? And she's like, oh, yeah, I've always had, like, you know, a big friend group. And Oprah said to her, is it all the same friends? Like, did you take all the same friends from Chicago to the White House? And this is what Michelle said. She's like, well, not all of them. And Oprah said, no. And she said, no, some of them, some of them lost their oxygen, couldn't make the climb. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? They lost their oxygen, couldn't make the climb. Oh shit. Like imagine you're one of Michelle Obama's friends in Chicago and then you're like, Oh, there she is. We don't get to talk anymore because she is married to the president and everything. And then she's just like, just couldn't do it. You couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't make the climb. 
you didn't have you didn't have the capacity to join us. I'm sitting here internally thinking, like, I don't know, would I have the oxygen if one of my I friends? I don't know. I don't think I, don't think I would. <laughs> I don't think I would. I, I might be one of those people, like you know, who keels over uh, on like the Hillary step on the you know on the way to the yeah. summit. But like, isn't that some shit, right? Like, lost their oxygen, couldn't make the climb. Woo! So when we talk about <laughs> what we're talking about here, it's like you, you said you don't go back, right? Right. It's like once you're uh, once you're on your way up, you don't go back to an old bar or a hangout. And does this in, does this mean that? the anti-hero typically or always in a narrative needs to be ascendant or descendant? Like, does there need to be some of that mobility happening? Yeah. They, they have to be entanglement free, you know, in order to do the things they're going to do, they can't be worried about the people they left behind and they can't be worried about what the people in the old bar are going to think about them. Um, once they're doing their thing, they they can't have people that um that might drag them out of the situation essentially so moving up would be like what moving up within a crime organization yeah or or moving up socially like you you get your big score you're not going to start knocking over dime stores you know and you're not going to be going back to the dive bar you're going to be going you're going to be going to you're going to go to um you're going to go to shutters Right. At, uh, <laughs> right. You'll be at four, you'll be at the Four Seasons, like in you'll the be bar. At the four Seasons, yeah. I mean, and and this is the important thing. It's like you go to find a guy to do a crime for you at a dive bar. You don't go to find a guy to do a crime for you at the Four Seasons. The guy at the Four Seasons, he's not going to do a crime for you. He's going to kill a guy. Yeah. The Four Seasons guy is going to kill a guy. <laughs> I love how you know this. Just like in... <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a different animal, and I think about it as it relates to a book like The Quiet American, for instance, which is Graham Greene. One of, Graham Greene, one of my favorite anti-hero books, um, one of my favorite crime novels, because Graham Greene, of course, is one of the most treasured novelists of our time. But he was such a nimble writer that he could go from the end of the affair to The Quiet American, and in writing The Quiet American, predict accurately the course of the Vietnam War in 1955. He accurately predicted everything that's going to happen. Um, but it is a noir novel about, uh, you know, a, a journalist and uh, a, um, a government operative who fall in love with the same woman. And what happens when two people on the same side fall in love with the same woman? What are you going to do? Well, someone's going to get killed. Um, or they're going to be the third force in the Vietnam War. Um, but that sort of novel, which is which came out of World War II, post-World War II, is about two people that have moved up. We've got a government operative who is at the top of his game in Pyle, um, and we've got the, the journalist whose name I can't recall all of a sudden, but he is a top war correspondent working in Vietnam. They're at the top of their game, and they are brought down by a woman. Um, by a femme fatale. Um, and what happens when that? Well, you know, they, they end up doing bad shit to each other. Um, God, I love that book. Okay, number nine. Are you ready for number nine, Brad? I am indeed. Never tell anyone your business and never tell a junkie your name. So what's this talking about? Well, don't surround yourself with unreliable people. Junkies, by nature, are unreliable people. You don't want them to know your name because they will always sell you out. Um, and in fact, to, to go back to my good dear friend, Rob Roberge, uh, a former junkie, in, <laughs> uh, in his book, Liar, he says, um, asking a junkie how his day is, is asking them to lie to you. I'm paraphrasing him because you just say, how you doing? He says, fine. That's a lie. I'm a junkie, you know? Um, and so for this anti-hero character, never tell anyone your business. You want to be the man with no name, right? Never tell a junkie even your name because a junkie will sell you out for a hit of whatever it is that they are addicted to. Um, and again, less entanglements, less problems. Uh, so this is like, and you know, these rules are great because they're, they're sort of uh, rooted in like, I don't know, like common vernacular and like like uh, gangster or noir tropes, but they encompass a lot more. 
You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like they're kind of tongue in cheek. What this is talking about, this rule is reticence and sort of yes. the code of the anti-hero yes. is to kind of keep your cards close to the vest. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're not going to have an anti-hero like, like sitting down at the bar and just like talking about his feelings to some stranger. <laughs> never, never, <laughs> never. All right. And now this is the last point and this is the most important one of them all. And I love this. And this is why Elmore Leonard paved the way for writers like me. Number 10, never associate with people known to be in crime. <laughs> so don't have any criminal friends. Don't associate with bad people. It's like, why would you ever want to be hanging out with that low life? And so what that does and what that says is we are a higher brand of, of criminal. We're not gonna we're not gonna beat up an old lady and steal her watch. I am going to screw over a corporation. I'm going to take money from organized crime. I am going to kill a mass murderer. I am going to right wrongs. Because that's what happens in crime novels is something a crime novel exists because something horrible has happened. And the only way to fix that is to have someone who is intimate with uh, the sort of violence of the moment, but isn't himself or herself an actual criminal. In in like there, you're never going to have an antihero who's a rapist. You're never going to have an antihero who's a pedophile. Your antihero might be a bank robber. They might be an assassin, but they're not going to be a person who hurts children, dogs, and women. You know, it's just not going to happen, and they're not going to associate themselves with people like that and it also is this is yet another way to sort of add dimension to their character and make them more relatable it's like the the assassin who shops at target and has like a really charming friendship with his next door neighbor ned who is an accountant right exactly instead exactly. of instead of like you know his best buddy who he plays tennis with is also a hitman that's not as interesting right it's it's not and it's because you know we all like to imagine um, our lives being more interesting than they are, right? Um, I look out my window. So here's the truth, listeners. If I look outside my window, I see two houses. One is a priest who performed my grandfather-in-law's funeral. He lives across the street from me. And then next to them is the house where my mother-in-law with my uh, grandfather-in-law used to live. So they live right across the street from me. So every day when I look out at those houses, I actually have a pretty good sense of what's going on in those two houses. But when I look to my right, there's a house where the neighbor is often, and I live in a big gated community on a golf course and a giant man-made lake. The neighbor is often sitting outside on his front porch, cleaning any number of extremely large guns. <laughs> And so me being the person that I am often engage him in conversation. And so I'll say, what's going on with the guns? And he's like, oh, I like to go shooting at the BLM land. And I said, oh, okay. And he's like, aren't, aren't you a murder guy? And I was like, yeah, I write, I write crime novels. He's like, you know, I'm a, I do a little bit of, uh, I guess you'd call it sort of merchant marining. And I was like, oh, so you are a smuggler? He's like, well, I, I wouldn't more like, like a Jimmy Buffett style. And, I, and like this dude, I swear to God, has got so many guns, he could take on the Russian army and win. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. He's like, I'd love to read one of those. And I was like, well, should I give this guy one of my books? And so I think, okay, I, I'll give him one of the books. So I gave him one of the books. Two weeks go by. I just smell him smoking weed in his backyard and shooting. Um, Wait, he shoots in his backyard? Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes he'll shoot up and out. <laughs> Toward the golf course late at night. Great. Also, there's, there's this. So this is going to sound crazy. So I live on a golf course in our backyard. And there's like dirt between the, our house and the golf course filled with um, creosote and stuff like that. And sometimes he'll just be out there burying things in it. <laughs> so, so I think your, your next book is writing itself here, Todd. Yeah. So. One day I go outside and he's standing up there and he's like, I finally read your book. A lot of great stuff in there. A lot of stuff you get wrong. And I was like, what, 
<laughs> what would I get wrong that you'd know about in a book about a hitman rabbi? <laughs> and he's just like, but a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Let's see. <laughs> and so my life isn't that interesting, but his life, my God, surely is. And so I think we're interested in characters like that because they're wild cards. These anti-heroes are wild cards. You don't ever know what they're going to say or do because their past seems murky. They have a code. They want to write things, um, but they aren't necessarily going to be the person who uh, is going to, you know, care for your puppy or something like that. Okay, so let me ask you, while we're here, because a lot of what we've been talking about has to do, I think, with what we would characterize as crime fiction or crime narratives. Yeah, yeah. For people listening who might want to write an anti-hero, is crime fiction, noir these kinds of things, gangster fiction, are these the only places that anti-heroes tend to exist? Can an anti-hero exist in other kinds of stories? Hmm. Well, they exist in Taylor Swift songs. <laughs> you know that. Um, and if you had a decent producer, this would be the time where they would backfill Taylor Swift's anti-hero uh, into here. But you don't want to pay that fee. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to say. Um, I don't think so. I mean, hero means something. Hero means that there's a situation where you need someone to solve a problem. So I don't think in um, I don't think in Ian McEwan's Atonement, for instance, that there is some badass, vaguely sociopathic person who's going to solve the lies of a ten-year-old child that ruin a family. I just explained the entire plot of Atonement without you need to read it. <laughs> um, or I, I don't I don't know if in Cavalier and Clay, there's an anti-hero, for instance. You know what, though? I just think, like, for literary, if people are writing literary fiction, I think oftentimes those kinds of protagonists are more fairly characterized as, like, misanthropic, though they, yeah. I, so, I sometimes see them called anti-heroes. You know, I'll, I'll give you one good example of an anti-hero in literary fiction. Susan Strait, who is my dear good friend, um, in her last book, Mecca, um, her main character in that book is a highway patrol officer who actually killed a guy when he was younger and buried him in the mountains. Also, I just now have ruined Susan Strait's novel, Mecca. For you. <laughs> and he is working, he's riding the freeways in and around the Inland Empire um, pre-pandemic. And it's, you know, it, it's a literary novel that, that's looking at sort of the disconnection of lives in Southern California and uh, the the racial crossings of, of families and uh, and how Southern California is both a melting pot and a cauldron. And he is really sort of an anti-hero because he is both the law and lawless. He has a code, but he'll break it. Um, and so that's a good use, but it, it's because he's an authority figure though, that I think the anti-hero title falls on him and there's crime involved i mean you know when you have a, yeah. you have a cop happening but i mean that's that's fair that's fair i just think these you know i think it's like the misanthropic sort of ne'er-do-well protagonist of lit fiction is a little bit blurrier than say like a noir anti-hero who has yeah. has more of a code it's like more distinguishable or something yeah i mean like i think about say like Richard Ford's Frank Bascom character, right? So the sports writer, Independence Day, Lay of the Land, his new book just came out, which I haven't read yet. He had a collection of stories called Let Me Be Frank With You. Four novels about this one character, and he is a misanthrope. He just, he, and he's got big opinions, and um, he can be an asshole and all these things, but he's not, he's a hero to himself, He's not a hero to anyone else. And I think that's the difference. You know, literary fiction has a tendency to go from the belly button in. And genre fiction tends to go from the belly button out. And because of that, in crime or noir fiction, place becomes really vital. Community becomes vital. And when a place and a community become vital, that means invariably someone needs something someone is um is helpless and when someone is helpless who do they turn to and that i think engenders the notion of the hero and the anti-hero because if you're if you're um 
if you are someone living, if you're a marginalized person living in a, in a major American city, you don't really feel like going to the cops these days. You know, if you're, if you're a transgender person living in Texas and you're beaten up inside your home, don't call the cops, you know, don't, you're going to jail and so are your parents. Um, like, so who, who solves your problems in that situation? And, and so all of a sudden, like a situation like that goes from a literary story, like, oh my God, this is this person who has this terrible thing happen to them to a genre story because now I need justice and society cannot provide that justice for me. Okay. So here's what I want to do now, just to try to kind of like underline all this a little bit more for listeners is to talk about Sal Cooper teen, because this mm -hmm. is the anti-hero that you know the best, obviously, since he's, it is indeed. he's yours. When you started, uh, you know, you know, your gangster land novels or the, you know, the first one, did you conceive of it at the outset thinking, I want to work in this tradition. I want to write a novel with an anti-hero. Like how did the germ of that character begin for you? And then at what point did you realize that this is what you were doing? Um, yes, I did want to write an anti-hero. And I wanted to write someone who starts off as a really bad person in theory. A mafia hitman. He goes out and kills who he's told to kill. He is the most efficient killer they have. He's called the Rain Man because he's got this remarkable memory, but also because it's a scary ass name to be called the rain man. <laughs> um, you know, he's like the Baba Duke, you know? Yeah. Um, and I wanted to write about that character realizing that he cared about something more than his job. I wanted that person to find some notion of faith. And I wanted that person to turn that notion of faith and this new, this new sense that he had to protect those around him to be the person who in effect protects an entire synagogue um i wanted this person to be to turn into a maccabean warrior you had all that at the beginning like it yeah yeah i knew that how did you know and, like what like i'm just curious <laughs> you know like what like, do you know what can you can you dig in and figure out where it comes from yeah so the genesis of these books was actually a short story that I wrote called Mitzvah that I wrote in 2008. Um, and it was about this guy's last day on the job. And as soon as I finished that short story, which ends with the word Mitzvah, um, I knew that I wanted, I was like, oh, I've, I've just written a really interesting story about a guy who has pretended to be something for so long that he became it, which is actually sort of a, a biblical precept of what you let your mind dwell on, you will become which I don't actually believe. Um, but that's why they ban books. You know, that, that's like, that's the, the thought process behind book banning is, oh, if you read this, you're going to become gay or tolerant. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm enraged and it passes. Okay. Um, yeah, book banning is never about compassion. Book banning is about control. Um, so when I wrote that short story, I realized, oh, there's really something here about this character but I didn't know enough about Judaism and being a rabbi to write it yet. Um, I, I think we talked about this many years ago when I was on the show with Gangsterland. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a pork eating beastie boy Jew. You know, I'm, I'm not, I didn't, I, I didn't even have a bar mitzvah. Um, I've got all the other important things taken care of, but I never had a bar mitzvah. Um, and so I spent, really like the next four years before I started to write Gangsterland, reading all of the holy books, reading the Talmud, the Torah, the Midrash, you know, the books on eschatology, the books on philosophy, all that stuff, so that I would know what this character would know eventually. Okay, I got to interrupt. What was the impact intended or not upon you, this research? Because when I read your books, I feel like there is a person of pretty deep and searching faith writing them. Did you come to a deeper understanding of faith and Judaism and spirituality or whatever it is via this character and the research process and the writing process? Yes, yes. I, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a, I'm a spiritual person. I believe that. And I am far more in tune with my lineage than I've ever been. To understand that to sit here today means 
I was the victim of tremendous luck. Um, my family always escaped just in time. And so to be um, the descendant of history, to be the descendant of witnesses to history and witnesses to carnage, there's weight that belongs to that. Um, there's debt that belongs to that. I have lived because my family got out. There was a line that I read early on in my, um, in my research, and I used it in, in Gangsterland, um, but it also informs the way I think about these books, but also the way I sort of think about my Judaism. Um, and this is from the Talmud, and the line is, if a man comes to kill you, wake up early and kill him first. <laughs> And so I'm not a, I'm not a hide in the attic Jew. <laughs> I'm a fight you in the streets Jew. Right. And like, that's the decision that I've made in my mind. Like, should it come to that? Well, what is, what um, is, like, you say your, your family always got out just in time. So I'm, I'm imagining they escaped Europe prior to Hitler's rise or at some point during the. Yeah. So my family escaped um, a, a town in Ukraine called Bar, Bar, Ukraine, um, where they killed all the Jews twice. They killed all the Jews in 1919, and they killed all the Jews in 1942. And we got out in 1918 and got to America in 1919. And um, if you go to, in fact, if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., which I recommend if you want to sob on your vacation, <laughs> there's this amazing... Um, sky bridge between two sides of the museum and in the sky bridge it's glass encased and etched into the glass are the names of all the cities where jews were exterminated and you have to look but you can find it and it's you know it's above like the handle it's like five up and to the right and there it is bar ukraine it just says bar b-a-r well my family name my middle name is is bear bar -er, b-a-r-e-r of bar. I am of that place. My family is of that place. Well, on your mom's side. On my mom's side. And if we hadn't gotten out of bar, all of us would be gone. Um, I wouldn't be having this conversation. You have to talk to, uh, you'd be talking to Franzen or something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of that, like when I learned all of that history, and I knew about all of, obviously my family escaping and all that, I knew that. Um, but when I, when I began to understand the larger meaning of what all of this meant, it's impossible not to have a profound effect on you. I mean, I, I suspect you're at, at about the same period that I am, but when I started writing these gangster books, I was, um, so I'm 52 now, I wrote Gangsterland, it came out in 2014, so I wrote it in 2012 and 2013. I was in my early 40s, um, my mom had just died, my dad was already dead. All my grandparents were dead. And so all of a sudden, you find yourself standing atop the family tree and realizing, oh, my God, like, I'm not just a branch anymore. Like, I'm it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the fucking tree now. <laughs> um, and, and so learning that what that means was important to me in the writing of the book. And then it became extraordinarily important to me in becoming a better person and a better man. Okay. So... This is why your books are so good and why they are beloved, I think, is that you are writing noir, crime fiction, but with a great measure of depth to it and personal investment and like personal risk. Like there's, there's blood on the page, you know, in more, mm -hmm. in more ways than one. I think that's an important lesson. Like I think you can write a great noir novel or a fun noir novel maybe without having so much personal investment, but to really write and elevate the genre, it seems to me that you do have to dig in deep like that. Yeah, and I think an interesting thing has happened in the recent years with crime fiction specifically. Um, and it's something that I, I mentioned Susan Strait earlier, and she, she had this great quote, which I'll read to you because I have it here in my notes. Um, she said, only mystery writers truly delineate and fully imagine America's often overlooked landscapes. Noir writers are best at giving readers a landscape and a specific place to move through and characters who are vivid and helpful and odd and suspicious. Um, 
And what she's saying essentially is that crime fiction holds a mirror up to society and forces you to look at the shit you don't want to look at. And I think where literary fiction used to do that, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird or The Great Gatsby or something, it's now literary fiction often becomes so much more personal and domesticated that it's not about looking at the world at large. It's, it's using a domestic situation as a uh, placeholder for a larger thing. Crime fiction doesn't do that. Crime fiction forces you to look at the ugly shit in the world. And so for me, um, as a writer, I don't want to just write a book where people shoot each other. You know, I, I could probably do that, but I don't want to do that. I want to write a book where people shoot each other and there's a reason for it. Um, and, and that those reasons fuck people up. That death and destruction and political problems and religious problems and religious bias and all of those things, sexual bias, gender bias, all those things have a consequence. And so I've tried to do that in these three novels and in the short story collection, uh, The Low Desert, which is connected to all of this, is I've tried to explore the spokes of the single crime, this one crime family that I've written about, the Cupertine crime family. Like what has this crime family wrought? What have they done? And I've tried to show these tiny little spokes. So even in like the low desert, um, in there's a short which, story. In which desert. incidentally we talked about on this show last yeah, time yeah, you appeared. Yeah. yeah. So it's worth, yeah. worth listening to that conversation. If you're into the low desert or you're interested in reading it. There's, there's a, there's a series of short stories in that book about, um, a cocktail waitress named Tanya who like has just one slight interaction with the mob. And it changes her entire life. And then it ends up changing her daughter's life as well. And I love to be able to write stories like that, which are literary, but have a tether to the criminal world. Because you can find something deeper when you're willing to look at the things most people shy away from. It's like looking, it's like, I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck this up, but like the systems novel. Like, yeah. you, you know, you're like, you're holding a mirror up as you're saying, and, and kind of forcing the reader to engage with some of the shitty, awful things about the world, right? Some of the, some of the most awful things. And right. it's also a way, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like it's also a way to explore corrupt systems, mm -hmm. right? Because you have these anti-heroes who are fixing, like Walter White is reacting against the corruption of our education system and the way that we treat teachers and compensate teachers and the way that they can't have a life, you know, like you can look at it through that lens, which is a very mm -hmm. entertaining lens, right? Bre <laughs> Breaking Bad is like this right. sensational, like well-told noir story, or you can write like a nonfiction book that's probably a lot more dry and right. probably maybe harder to, it's like the spoonful of sugar almost, the noir lens. It, it helps the medicine go down, right? I mean, right. and, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I have a question tied to that, but it's just like trying to kind of bring it into greater focus. Like, it's a way to explore fucked up systems. So there's a, there's a great quote from the Maltese Falcon. And, and this is, if you've never heard this quote, listeners, um, you have not read enough and your education was terrible, you should come get an MFA at UCR. Um, <laughs> it is at the end of the Maltese Falcon, and um, the, uh, the femme fatale has just come in to, to uh, ask the detective to let her go. Um, and he says to her, I'm a detective and expecting me to run criminals down and then let them go free is like asking a dog to catch a rabbit and let it go. It can be done, all right. And sometimes it is done, but it's not the natural thing. Like that's the essence of the antihero right there. And that's the essence of crime and noir fiction. It's like, there are margins that I'll go over. And sometimes I'll break the law. But it's not the natural thing. And the natural thing is whatever that code is that that person has. And is the code different for each anti hero? Like each one's got a slightly different variation on the same code? Yeah, I, I think they have to, you know, so like, um, for me, so Sal Cupertine, for instance, um, in the books, will never kill a woman, will never hurt a woman until in Gangster Nation, he, he accidentally kills a woman. Well, it's not an accident. He thinks she's someone and she's someone else and he kills her. And in this last book, um, this isn't a spoiler, 
because it starts pretty quickly. He's literally haunted by her. Um, I mean, she's not a ghost, but like the specter of what he's done has really fucked him up. And he can't stop feeling like basically killing her is the equivalent of killing his wife. You know, like, what have I done? Who have I become that I've killed this woman? Um, and so that's his code. He won't kill a woman until he does. It's not the natural thing. And sometimes you don't do the natural thing. But um, so that's his code. Or he won't kill people that aren't in the game, as it were. So he's not going to kill someone who isn't a criminal or, or um, doing bad things unless, well, unless there's something that he wants. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and I'm reminded, actually, the, the reason that that's true is my sister, Karen, who's the most moral and ethical person on the planet. I love my sister, Karen, um, a lawyer, just great, has sued a lot of people for me. Um, <laughs> one day um, she said to me, Todd, I want you to know, look, I would never stand in the way of you getting something that you wanted. And my, like, my sister, Karen, and my brother, Lee, essentially raised me and my sister, Linda. And I was like, oh, thank you, Karen. And she's like, unless there was only one of them, and I wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I just want to interject. Your, is your brother, Brother Lee's the one who filmed, like, caught the kid, the intruders yes. on camera? Yes. Oh, my yes. God. I saw this on social media the other day. There's these, uh, you know, security cameras on Lee's house that captured, like, like what, four or five dudes four, with like four, pantyhose four. over their heads, like crawling through his shrubs, like the most ter like the ultimate nightmare of like home break in, home invasion. These dudes, like, were army crawling through his shrubs. Yeah, four ninja assassins Jesus. who just robbed his neighbor's house, incidentally, stole their safe and threw it down the side of the mountain. So Lee caught them on his his home video. Um, which like he, my brother's, <laughs> so the funny thing about my brother is I'm a next door troll. I just go on next door and talk shit to people. <laughs> my brother is the person who goes on next door and posts videos of the bobcats in his backyard and the coyotes. Oh, warning. There's a bobcat. <laughs> well, surprise Lee, you live in Calabasas. <laughs> there's going to be some bobcats. Um, but so he always gets an alert when there's something in his yard. So in case he wants to put it on next door and here's four dudes frog crawling across his backyard into his house and he said the first thought that he had was i'm gonna confront them because my brother like me writes crime novels and we believe we are our own characters and his wife was like are you a fucking idiot call 911 <laughs> right. and he was like right <laughs> right <laughs> i'm gonna call 911 or else we'd be talking about how i used to have a brother named Lee. <laughs> um and so he called 911 and the 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 criminals the assassins must have seen him because they turned around immediately and ran back down the hill cops got there within five minutes and and my understanding is they've um they've arrested uh people related to it at least um so that's good but so if, if you didn't see this video folks i don't know how you avoided it because it was literally on every news station and in every newspaper around the world for a week and it's crime, it and, and, and your brother also is a crime novelist. I mean, like, right? This shit only happens to the right people. The crime novelist, <laughs> right. and and of course Lee, um, his he has a book coming out this week also, and so he's like, he, he, he's we were talking. He's like, oh man, all these all these newspapers and news stations want to interview me. It's just getting so tiresome. I was like, well, you know, you could you could just say no. He's like, I've got a book coming out. <laughs> I was like, I was like. Got to ride this wave. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> he's like, I don't know if this is helping or hurting. I'm not, I'm not gonna stop. I mean, he's like, I'm on Inside Edition tomorrow at 7 p.m. I was like, is Maury Povich gonna interview you? Like, well, but only it can only happen to us where um, to a Goldberg where the 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 headline was crime novelist thwarts a home invasion, and it's like, I, I, I mean. <laughs> He turned on his lights. <laughs> but, you know, take, we'll take thwarts, you know. <laughs> yeah, he, he, I was like, thwarts? Foils? You turned on your lights and they scurried back off down the mountain. But these guys got more press than an actual serial killer. They were on, like, they were in the Daily Mail and, you know, the Guardian. And those four guys must have been like, fuck, man, we picked the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then they're going to wind up in a novel at some point, probably. So. Yeah. God, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, before I, I be surprised. before I forget, and I, I want to bring up the issue of gender. You sort of touched on it a couple times, but maybe not in this particular way. 
But so often when we think of antiheroes and when we talk about popular antiheroes in the culture, it's usually men. Right. Women can be antiheroes too, though. Oh, absolutely. And there's been a ton lately. Um, you know, you're seeing it a lot in uh, the sort of uh, great new crime fiction by writers like Ivy Pakoda. Um, you know, her new book, Sing Her Down, has got two, three actual badass antiheroes. By the way, I talked to Ivy on this show about that book. Oh, it's a brilliant book. And she's a, she's a genius. Ivy and I are, are good friends. Um, and I, her success makes me so happy because I think she's the absolute best crime writer working right now, not named Goldberg. <laughs> um, I, and I, I love her as a human as well. But, you know, her books, you know, she's doing something completely different. You know, she's writing her previous books. She was writing sort of victim forward narratives. But seeing her down, she's got a badass antihero cop character, Lobos, who is going to have her own books eventually. Um, she does great stuff. Wait, do you, um, do you know that for a fact or are you just predicting that? Oh, I'm just predicting it. Okay. Yeah, because I read that. I mean, I read that novel. I, I like Lobos. I thought that that, that yeah. there's something kind of Karen Sisko-esque. Yes. In yes, Lobos. absolutely. I just watched a uh, a show last night until three o'clock in the morning. That is not very good unless you're friends with the showrunner, and then we'll retape this. Called <laughs> "Who Is Aaron Carter?" It's some British show that's on Netflix because apparently we aren't making television shows anymore because of a <laughs> widespread strike. Strike, and it's about a female antihero. She's you know uh, she's got some mysterious past, and she escapes England and moves to Barcelona. And she interrupts a, uh, a grocery store robbery going down and ends up fucking everybody up. And you're like, she's not what she seems. Um, so you see a lot of that. And I think like the lineage of that too sort of comes from La Femme Nikita, you know, like every, every great uh, badass female assassin character is sort of a direct descendant of La Femme Nikita, which I loved that. Like that was, that was a, an important movie for me. Um, but you're seeing a lot of it, and, and some some great women writers out there. You know, I, I mentioned Ivy, but writers like Steph Shaw and Megan Abbott. But if you want to read the ur text of a a woman antihero, there's a book called Miami Purity by a writer named Vicky Hendricks. Purity, like purity, yeah. Okay, Miami Purity, um, which is the most violent, sex filled awesome anti-hero novel ever written i think if i remember correctly the opening line is uh jimmy was drunk and slugged me so i hit him with the radio i didn't think it would kill him <laughs> something like that <laughs> and it's it's just like this badass woman taking revenge it is so good and vicky hendrix um she wrote i think six or seven books miami purity was her most popular but she sort of um, brought in this era of what they used to call back then Tarte Noir. Um, and she was sort of the like the founder of Tarte Noir. And it's just hardcore badass women fucking people up. Okay. Love it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, like we've gone over Elmore Leonard's rules. We've touched on lots of different uh, great examples of noir, you know, and we've talked about a lot of the nuances. Are there things that we have not yet touched upon? Um, I think the when we think about um, antiheroes, it is often tied to actual social tumult. Like the rise of the antihero comes from something. So think about all the antihero movies and books that came out in the 1970s post-Vietnam, for instance. And the reason is you've got all these people coming back from war that are traumatized that know how to use guns, and they come back to a country that hates them. Is, it, government is Rambo an antihero? <laughs> and Rambo's a full antihero. Full antihero. Absolutely. Um, Rambo, you know, every character Charles Bronson played, Dirty Harry, um, that whole era of books, you know, like Dog Soldiers by Robert Stone, um, you know, where you are, or, or even, even like the... Um, the dirty realist era of American short fiction. So like the Richard Fords, um, the Tim O'Briens, um, even Dennis Johnson, to some extent. You're, I mean, actually, Dennis Johnson is a good example. 
he had three books that were essentially noir novels angels resuscitation of a hanged man and um i think jesus's son counts sort of as a novel i think of it as a novel but jesus's son is filled with anti-heroes every single character in there is strung out doing something weird um i love that book so you see it as a re as a reflection of what's going on in society jump forward to the 1980s for instance uh, in the 19, early 1990s, you get a book like American Psycho, which is a reflection back on the, the greed is good era of America, where the, the, the expansion of the richest 1% compared to the rest of us grew exponentially. And you have that pushback. You have that anti-hero like um, uh, Patrick American Bateman. Psycho, Patrick Bateman, or you get something like Fight Club where you have an anti-hero who is literally going to bring down buildings in a city. You're going to fight the establishment at its core. And it's going to be people coming up out of the service industry to fight the corporations. Now, you also see that in Cannery Row. You see that in Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden, you know, that where the, the oppressed worker is coming back against the rich landowner, right? You're seeing that over and over and over again. Those there's there's an anti-hero quality to those books as well. So present day, you know, post Donald Trump, post uh, a series of, of wars and all that stuff, um, what are we going to get? You know, what kind of anti-heroes are we getting today? Yeah, I was going to say let's try to. I mean, I don't know. This might be too big of a of a lift in in a podcast, but it'd be kind of a fun exercise. Like, how would we build one today if we're going to take your theory that that you know. Like there's got to be social tumult or political tumult that is kind of the context in which antiheroes are born. You know, you have what an era w in which American democracy is in peril and you have like an authentic fascist movement afoot mm -hmm. in the country. And like you say, it's about what you can get away with. You know, right. It's uh, it's like uh, sedition is a strategy now. You know, it's like a political strategy. Right. And I think you're seeing, um, you know, let like a show, and I know I'm talking a lot about TV versus books, but you're seeing it, you see a lot in TV lately. A show like The Boys, where it's literally superheroes who are terrible, and then you have anti-heroes who are fighting the superheroes to try to reveal that they are corporate-owned pawns, that they are just government tools, essentially. Um, where you have scrappy underdogs, essentially you have the... Um, uh, you know, the, the Warsaw uprising against the superheroes is what you're seeing. Um, so I, I think you're beginning to see the fight back against government, but you're also seeing the fight back against disinformation that's happening in, in, um, more quickly in TV because it's, it, you can make TV more quickly. Um, but post Trump, you know, what the, the big crime novels that have been out, um, well, let even just think about this year. So a novel like Dennis Lehane's Small Mercies has an anti-hero at the center of it. Small Mercies actually takes place during the busing crisis in Boston in the 1970s. But you have a woman who is searching for uh, her missing daughter who has to come up against organized crime, the city, every other person in her neighborhood, um, and the world that says a woman can't do certain things and can't be tough, all to find her missing daughter. And of course, it's a parable for everything that we're seeing today as well. So you've got a book like that. You've got a book like um, uh, Sean Cosby's uh, Razorblade Tears, which is about two ex-cons whose gay sons are murdered, and they have to go out and solve the murder of their two sons because the police aren't Doing it. That feels very contemporary. It, that does not feel like something very, that would have been written in the 1980s. <laughs> it could not have been. And and Sean Sean's doing amazing work. If you're not if you're not reading his books, you should. Um, but Sean really is imbuing his books with a, a big social contract. Um, so I, and and maybe that's the best one to think about with it. You know, two hardened ex-con, one black, one white, who are going after the killers of their gay sons, like. That's not a novel that was, could have been written in 1975. You just wouldn't, they wouldn't have done it. Um, and so you're seeing that. And, and I think that is a reflection of our culture today. You know, if you told me 10 years ago that gay marriage would be less acceptable now than it was when we accepted it as law, I would have told you you were crazy. I thought we were on a path toward radical acceptance and it turns out that we're in a boomerang and that is not 
good. Right. Yeah, I'm the same way. I thought when Obama was elected, I was like, finally, we did it. You know, I felt like yeah. felt like we had, like you said, started, not that we were done, but that we were on a trajectory that was just going to be better and saner. And then yeah. we backslid and hopefully we can get past this insanity, you know, fully. Uh, that would be that would be lovely. But if not, I'm pre- I'm prepared to take to the streets and fuck somebody up. <laughs> I would do it. I would. Provided provided it happens before eight o'clock, I'm a bit of a sundowner now. I used I used to be a night guy, but now it's like yeah. Um, oh, give me a gu- give me a gummy and a game show, and I'm set for the night. <laughs> So, uh, is there anything that I have failed to ask you that you wish I would have? I mean, is there anything that I just left open? No, I don't think so. I mean, other than, um, other than why am I so handsome? (laughs) Uh, I don't think so. You know, actually, I will tell you something funny though. Um, so sometimes I worry about myself (laughs) and listeners when, uh, now that you've listened to the show for the last 90 minutes or whatever, you can go back and listen to the previous episodes. You can see that I am devolving. Um, <laughs> and so sometimes I worry like, man, the thoughts that I have in my head probably aren't healthy. But I'm a, I'm a normal um, functioning member of society. I just write crime fiction. But I've got a friend, a, a wonderful writer, um, also, uh, Joe Loya. Have you ever met Joe before? I have friend? not. I have not. Joe's a great guy. Um, he did, I think, nine years in prison. Um, seven years in solitary. Um, he was a bank robber and, and a violent bank robber. Um, but he's gone on to be a, a writer and a screenwriter. And I'm, I've been always been a big fan of his nonfiction work. And his, he just had a, a podcast that he hosted. Anyway, big fan of this guy. And I'd always, I've always mentioned him in lectures that I do because I, I think he has a real interesting take on things. And so one day, I, I hadn't met them at, at this point. I mentioned him in a lecture and someone texted him from the lecture and said, hey, Todd Goldberg just said something about you. And I get an email the next day that says, I heard you were talking about me. And I was like, oh shit, like I don't, like that's not a guy I want to piss off, right? <laughs> and he was like, oh man, I'm a big fan. You know, I love your work. And I was like, oh, thank Jesus Christ, thank God. <laughs> and so we became, we became friends, but I had never met him in real life before. And I swear this has a point. Um, and so a couple years ago, I was up in the Bay Area and we met up for coffee at a Starbucks in um, in Orinda, which is just the most like white people with with handbags were created in Orinda. <laughs> um, and he's a big dude who exudes "Don't fuck with me." And he walks into the Starbucks, and I'm sitting there waiting for him. And people like visibly like moved back, and I was like, "Oh, this is fascinating to me to watch this." And then he came over and. He ordered a purple drink and we, we talked and people <laughs> people calmed down. But I, at one point I said to him, I was like, like, why do you like to read my stuff when you're out there doing it? And he was like, no, no, you and I, we, we think alike. And I was like, you and I think alike? He's like, yeah. I was like, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you and I think alike. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, the difference is, and I'm not going to use the word that he used because it's inappropriate. He said, the difference is you're a wimp. <laughs> And I said, I am a wimp. So that was, <laughs> Fair enough. So that, so that was not the word. Yeah. <laughs> I, think that was, I am a wimp. And he's like, sometimes you're in an elevator and you're surrounded by people and someone says something dumb and your thought is, I'd like to slam that guy's face into the wall. And I was like, I do have that thought. He's like, the difference is, I used to have that thought too. And when I was 25, I'd do it. Right. <laughs> and I was like, Right. He's like, but I also didn't realize I was bipolar and unmedicated. He's like, I wouldn't do it now, but it doesn't mean I don't still have those thoughts. Um, and so sometimes like I worry, like, I hope I'm doing some good with the things that I'm writing about. Like, I hope that, I hope that readers begin to understand like the criminal mind a little bit by the way that I portray them so that you understand that, that it's not even just about being evil. Um, some people are just, not right. <laughs> so since you are an academic and you have been teaching this stuff for so long, um, as a way to close, I'd love to just kind of review just a, it doesn't have to be a ton, but just a few great works that you feel are like shining examples of the antihero. We've talked about out of sight, Elmore Leonard, his body of work. Uh, and then as well, are there craft books? or like craft essays that you teach from, or you could point people to where they could explore this stuff in greater depth? Is there anything 
on your radar that comes top of mind? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a couple great books. Uh, the Ice Harvest by Scott Phillips. Great anti-hero book. Um, an underappreciated classic. Also a pretty good movie um, with uh, um, John Cusack in it. Um, Mystic River isn't really a um, an anti-hero book per se, but it is. Um, and it's also, it does the thing that we're talking about with social critique. So Mystic River by Dennis Lehane, because you really have two anti-heroes. You have an anti-hero cop and you have an anti-hero mob boss and they both both make mistakes. Um, let me think of some other good stuff here. I happen to have a list right here written down. Um, Dog Soldiers by Robert Stone. Um, uh, Red, oh, Red Harvest. So you got you to gotta learn your history. So Red Harvest by Dashiell Hammett is about a guy called the Continental Op who gets sent to a town called Poisonville, a little on the nose, <laughs> um, which is a corporately owned town with the job of with the job of kill everyone. <laughs> and so he goes and this guy kills like 57 people in this town. It's a great book. Um, James M. Cain, Pastoral is a great short story. Um, you know what, you know what the Ur text though really is for an antihero is the cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, anyone who has been done wrong, in their life has had the um the desire for revenge but rare is the revenge played out as as well as with the charming narrator of the cask of amontillado who gets that guy to walk all the way down to the catacombs chain himself to a wall and get spackled in <laughs> oh god i love the cask of amontillado um so that's sort of a, a classic um and, you know, when, when you think of some of the great crime writers working today that are doing anti-hero stuff, uh, I mentioned Sean Cosby. Jordan Harper is a great one. Megan Abbott, uh, a fantastic writer. Uh, I mentioned Ivy Pakoda. Um, we're really in sort of a golden era for um, for crime fiction right now. Um, if, and if you want to read a non-anti-hero, my brother solely writes heroes. It's a weird thing. This is This should be someone's critical study paper. My brother only writes heroes, and I only write antiheroes. Interesting. That is weird. Gonna have to get a D we're um, gonna have to get a DNA sample to uh, dig into somehow and explore. <laughs> oh, I would like proof that he is maybe not one hundred percent my brother. Um, you know what? You know what the best book I've ever read related to crime is? It's, it's actually not a craft book or anything like that. It is a book called On Killing. Um, and it is written by, I have it written down here somewhere. Um, On Killing is a book by, what's his name? Where is it? Well, I'll find it eventually. But it is about the history of killing in the American military. Uh, oh, David Grossman oh, okay. is his name. Okay. Um, and it talks about um, the effects of killing on soldiers. And it, it talks about the how um, we desensitize our soldiers now to kill. And the reason that they come back so fucked up is that we have trained empathy out of them. Um, and so it, it taught me to understand, like when I, when I mentioned earlier, like the people coming out of World War I, why they became the private detectives, why they became the anti-heroes, people coming out of World War II, why they got into it. And then when you come post-Vietnam, they don't become cops, they become killers. Why is that? Well, post-Vietnam is when we started to train our soldiers to kill. So prior to the Vietnam War, this is an amazing stat from this book, I've, I've kept it in my mind, the average soldier only was able to hit their target 25% of the time. So the human nature tells you don't kill another human being. It's against our code as humans to kill. And if you're not a sociopath, you're going to aim higher, you're going to aim low, you're not going to hit your target. Well, that was because in the training prior to that, they didn't use humans. They used sandbags that you were shooting at. Now, when they train you to kill, 
of course it used to be outlines of bodies and now it's virtual reality bodies that you're shooting or video game style shooting and you are shooting people and so you get desensitized to shooting people and so you go to war you shoot people um and so that number went from 25 percent to something like 78 percent vietnam and beyond um and so there's this there's, there's a quote here and i've actually used this when i think about the the characters that i write this is from the book on killing not having to look at the face of the victim provides a form of psychological distance that enables the shooter's subsequent denial and rationalization and acceptance of having killed a fellow human being if one does not have to look into the eyes when killing it is much easier to deny the humanity of the victim this is why we have drones this is why now we have hundreds of kids that are being trained to be drone navigators because it's a video game. You don't have to admit the humanity of the person on the ground. They're just a dot. Right, right. And that comes, that comes from this book, but it's also the ethos that I gave Sal Cupertine where when he wants to kill a guy, he walks up and shoots them in the back of the head because he doesn't have to then look them in the face. Well, that's, I mean, that's like a, I think that feels like a little bit of an unorthodox choice for a noir writer to be reading this military book. <laughs> it is, but, a little but, bit. But informative and effective. And like, I think it adds a measure of depth when you're trying to understand how people are able to kill and why. And then it also brings to mind something we talked about the last time you were on this show when you were we were talking about how you had gone off to like police camp or whatever. Yes, yes, yeah. You know, so like these are the <laughs> these are important things for listeners, especially listeners who are attempting to write in this vein or would like to write in this vein someday. You know, these are the good things to know that someone who's successful at it has read a book like On Killing, which is about the military, isn't really about fiction writing or noir per se, but is very informative and helps you to round out your characters in a way that's really believable. Mm. And then going to police camp, like schlepping up to, I think it was in Wisconsin, <laughs> wasn't it? Or Yeah, it was, it was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It's called the Writer's Police Academy. The what police academy? Writer's Police Academy. Okay, yeah, so writers go and they interact with like retired law enforcement personnel or, or oh, no. active. Current. Yeah. <laughs> Current. You get you get on the job racists. Okay, and but they teach you they teach you like like law enforcement protocol that helps yeah. you that helps you then write yep. more believable law enforcement yeah. and like chase scenes or whatever it might be. Yep, yeah, it, it's hugely helpful. And I mean, just to get the way that they walk and they talk is important because cops tan different, you know, they because they got the weight on their hips and the weight of all the injustice that they've done on their minds. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just beat somebody for no reason. You know. Oh, I got to stand a little funny. I feel I tore my shoulder <laughs> beating the perp. <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, we could continue, but I think that this gives people like a foundation, you know, when it comes to yes. the anti-hero issue in particular. And I think the best training of all is just to read great noir and to read great anti-heroes. I agree. Giving yeah. people a place to start and they can explore from there. So congratulations on Gangsters Don't Die. Congratulations on the run that you've been on with, uh, you know, Thank all you. the gang, like Gangsterland, Gangster Nation, Gangsters Don't Die, and The Low Desert, which I think as a body of work in its genre stands up. Like, Thank you. Like, uh, feel, proudly. Feel, so kudos to you. I feel good about it. I feel good. You know, I spent, I spent over a decade writing these four books, and um, rare is it that I write something and feel like, oh, that's how I wanted it to be. But this is, it, I've ended this exactly how I wanted to end it. Awesome. Well, I've ended this episode exactly. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Look at us. Can we get a slow clap, everybody? <laughs> this is a very adorable moment. But I, I, uh, I deeply appreciate the time, Todd. Thank you for uh, talking with me about this. I'm sure my listeners are grateful, so appreciate it. You are most welcome. Go out there and write well, folks. <laughs> <laughs>